Yeah, response video to the hover blubber guy. I'll leave a link below. Um, probably not going to be a for everybody conversation. Um, sort of about epigenetics and uh, evolution and genetic code and how it's read and blah blah blah. So anyway, um, all right. I think the more important aspect. I mean, first let's just agree that we're talking about a tiny, a very small. Uh, influence area for influence in terms of the evolution of an organism especially I would argue for I when I said higher mammals are more advanced or whatever I said um, I think it makes a huge difference because uh, you know the environment we live in is much more diverse now and it's very hard for any effect to be effectively transferred there's no it's, there, it would be very in, unadvantageous for an organism to assume something from the current conditions. From my life to uh, the life of my prodigy could be very different. And that's sort of what's made evident, I think, is, is just that, you know, depending on when you're... <laughs> the human environment is much more complex, I guess is what I'm saying, right? We go from periods of war to periods of peace to periods of famine to periods of you know whatever I mean it's just really diverse environments that we live in and again we're talking about code passed on by the female or not code but instrumentality um, and uh, it's not very applicable in organisms that have uh, a large amount of sexual deviation um, females traditionally lived in very a very different life than the males lived in many mammalian species. That's the truth. Um, they're just almost entirely different lives. And so um, anything expressed in the female's epigenetic code might be very um, unhelpful to a male child. So I think there would be... Um, mechanisms put in place over time with evolution that would um, protect against uh, epigenetic effects that would um, in any way dominate or make a, have a controlling change in functionality. The change would have to be or should be or would be made to be quite subtle I think. Oh, this damn ear is driving me nuts. <sighs> and can't hear. Anyway, I don't know if it's infected again or whether it's just the eardrops that are doing it or I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's just annoying. Um, I don't care for it. It doesn't hurt, so I assume it's not infected, but that doesn't mean too much, right? Right. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so yeah, so so I guess for somebody who cares to know, I mean, I don't, I hate to do instruction videos. I mean, you know, because, you know. Well, anyway, I mean, the whole idea here is that we're talking about the the there's there's a whole bunch of features of the mechanics of a cell function that's passed on from female to female. I mean, from female to everything. I mean, to both to, to that's passed on by the female. That's not part of the genetic code but it's just part of the, the original egg cell. And that mechanical instrumentality is, um, yeah, it's vital to the creation of the fetus. And, uh, you know, but it's also just part of your entire, all your DNA is inherited. I mean, all the DNA hardware is inherited from your mother, from on the female side. And, um, you know, that... That hardware doesn't have any expression in the DNA code itself. It's not a coded feature. So it's been passed down as just hardware, almost like the membrane. You could argue that the cellular membrane hasn't been passed down. It's been augmented. It's, it's somewhat um, controlled by the DNA in that it can be, features can be added to it. But I mean, the idea of it itself, the, the splitting of the membrane, is still a function of replication. 
it's, it goes with the new cell. The new cell doesn't build the membrane. It takes a piece of the old one. So I guess that's what I'm arguing. There's some parts of you that are passed on as pieces of the original, um, more than just the DNA molecules. There's uh, hardware that goes with it. And so we're talking, when we talk about epigenetics, we're talking about that hardware. And a lot of that hardware has to do with reading the DNA, you know, the chemicals that do that and interact with the DNA in different ways um, to um, even prepare it for reading, you could almost argue. But, yeah, I don't want to get into that kind of conversation. Um, I'm not, not look, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not claiming expertise on this subject, but um, um, I just have general knowledge. Uh, and certainly some knowledge of the human studies um, that, you know, basically what it came down to was it's very hard for epigenetics to code or to create switches uh, for any kind of positive behavior just because our lives are so complicated. Hey, pup. Come on. Hi, pup. How you doing? Hi. Ah, you know, bassets. Um, so yeah, it's very hard to code. I mean, it's very hard to express some kind of useful crude mechanism. Crude mechanisms aren't going to be very good at uh, anticipating what we need in the future. Uh, just because our lives are so complicated. We're not bacterium. We're not living in one kind of environment where there's one kind of big change or, you know, the patterns of our life are not uh, the same. We have ice ages every 10,000 years. You know, we, we're just not interrupted by the same scale of event. And so uh, it would there'd be no point in having a mechanism that um, didn't check against uh, the code reader being broken or changing too many things or becoming an evolutionary feature uh, because it'd be much harder to fix it if it did make changes. Uh, let's see what else helps to explain this. I mean, I've brought up sperm cells before because it's kind of a funny little piece of our hardware in that they don't have any way to evolve, theoretically. The only, the only way they can evolve is in competition with other sperm cells from another donor. <laughs> the, you know, that's the only measure of a competition that could be useful because they are all coded the same. So even though they're competing with each other in a, in a very vital competition, there's no representation of that competition in the sperm cells themselves and therefore no way for it to have an evolutionary impact. The winning sperm cell doesn't get to express his victory in any way <laughs> in terms of creating better sperm cells. Uh, like I said, unless the competition is with um, the forces opposing the sperm, or, you know, from the woman, <coughs> or, um, uh, you know, a competing male's donation. So the only mechanisms they have are mechanisms that make them capable of playing some war games with uh, competing sperm. Uh, but that's the only way they can express any evolution. Uh, in terms of mutations that might take place to them. Their mutations are kind of lost in the um, genetic code uh, substantially. Uh, there's no way to re-represent them. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, didn't empty the memory. Anyway, and these batteries are now iffy, so who knows. We'll finish this or not. Um, anyway, I don't want to drag it out, but it's sort of an interesting subject, the whole DNA molecule and how it functions. So anyway, back to this uh, epigenetic thing. All right, this is uh, hardware that's, uh, it evolves, but it doesn't evolve much. It's not carried on the blueprint. It's not part of the DNA per se. 
but the DNA molecule is evolving to the hardware. So that's part of the connection here that I'm getting to, is that in complex mammals, what happens epigenetically is that uh, when the epigenetics breaks down, let's say, the more advanced features are perhaps more fragile, um, or there's just more fragile features, features that are more fragile in terms of um, their function, you know, compounds that exist or don't exist, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a hardware toolkit, and you can, tools can fall out of the bucket, so to speak, of your epigenetics. And if you lose those tools, there will be parts of the DNA that have evolved, assuming their existence. And without their existence, you end up not reading code, uh, new code. And so you don't jump to the don't grow a tail program in development, and instead you end up growing a tail. And that's what I meant by errors, that uh, you know, most of the effects on epigenetics, I think in advanced mammals, are just going to be um, ones that are a reflection of damage. They're not going to be practically useful in terms of detecting DDT in the environment and reacting to it in some way. Um, again, you have to understand that your, the epigenetics is a, is a very slow evolving um, element of your DNA. It uh, doesn't have the same, it has some um, mitocardial DNA, it has some, some DNA molecules in it that provide some of the functionality of the basic hardware kit that goes with the female to um, accomplish the task of, of uh, reading the code. But that's really, I guess, essentially all it is. It's a code reader. And uh, the code reader can be functional or dysfunctional. And there's going to be a lot of code on the DNA molecule itself. And those genes are going to evolve to the function of the code reader. Um, and so, again, I'd say there's a tension between the two. Um, and the DNA molecule certainly is going to take precedent uh, you know, in terms of controlling evolution. Of, um, and uh, you know, the hardware kit, I think, is going to remain crude in most cases, extremely crude. So I don't think there's going to be much room for, um, you know, much of an impact in the more complex, um, environmentally diverse animals. The animals that have to um, adapt to a very, to a changing world, but not, but a very complex world. Um, we don't have too many um, features of our physical existence that are at all consistent. Uh, what causes stress generation to generation is very different. Um, you know, what we're fighting for and fighting with changes. Uh, even physically, what threatens us uh, is so much different. Um, you know, because we have uh, medical interventions. Um, that's perhaps a more interesting subject is just the fact that we are not, in a practical sense, doing much productive evolution because we've in so many ways broken uh, natural selection, um, at least in how it affects the DNA molecule. Now, whether modern man has also done some damage to epigenetic function, uh, degraded it through survival of, um, you know, chronically broken uh, epigenetic samplings, you know, um, it's certainly a possibility. I mean, if you, so this is the catch. Let's say something dies, the membrane of the cell blue. <laughs> um, and uh, theoretically, if, if that becomes part of the epigenetic code, in the sense that the, it's a cell that divides into creating the female's egg, that blueness would be inherited by her daughters. And uh, they, <clears throat> they would have 
they would carry the trait of blue membrane, um, you know, that stain. So what I, what I, the point is, is that, you know, the, the, there's still evolution, but it's evolution in this crude manner where it's not really the test is a different kind of test. Um, how do I put it? Uh, but the point is, you could certainly, it'd be, you can imagine, it'd be very easy to cre create degrades in the system and yet still functions barely or su suitably. And that, uh, you know, all the prodigy would be stuck with that um, you know, dull functionality. Uh, the only good news would be is that the DNA would still be attempting to evolve out of any failures built into the uh, basic um, structure of the code that builds the new addition and the new human. Um, or like I said, this is probably true for all complex mammals, all, high, high, all mammals essentially. It, it, their lives are pretty complicated and there is a lot of diversity in uh, how they live based on sex and hierarchy. So, um, <clears throat> some traits actually might be epigenetically controlled. I'm not sure about, uh, you know, the, the changes that take place in, in uh, male orangutans, um, you know, alpha males. That might be something handed down by their mother based on her status in a troop. But I don't think it is. I think that might be true of bonobos. But I don't think it's true of orangutans. So anyway, yeah, it has an influence, but it's not really an evolutionary influence because epigenetic code doesn't evolve at nearly the rate at which uh, the chromosomes can evolve. And uh, in more complex creatures, any changes, you know, a blue membrane isn't likely to be, um, sorry, <laughs> my word, um, a major change. You're not going to get, you're not going to get very complex changes. They're going to be simple changes, probably of little consequence, rather than major changes of significant consequence. And because we aren't animals just swimming in a sea of 10 chemicals, you're not going to have epigenetic effects that can control for subtle chemical changes in the environment. Um, so I just don't think epigenetics is a very interesting subject in higher mammals. It's, uh, it's a 0.0001% of the evolutionary interesting <laughs> elements. It's a very small percentage of um, um, evolutionary significance or influence. So anyway, I didn't want to drag this out, but I ended up doing it anyway. That's what I do. Uh, I think there's anything else to say. I got cotton in my ear, so I'm... <sighs> yeah, it sounds like a very much like an internal conversation. <sighs> so I'm really deaf in this ear, unfortunately. This ear sucks. It doesn't work very well. So, anyway, swimming season's almost over, so I'm going to go quit <laughs> doing whatever it is I'm doing. I'm probably ending up with water behind my eardrum, I guess. At least it feels that way this time. It doesn't feel infected, it just feels completely not useful. Anyway. Next time, very warm, nice day. Too bad it wasn't like this in the summer. <laughs> yeah, At the end of the year it gets nice. That's the end of the summer. Anyway, till next time.